I appreciate this opportunity to share with you another lesson in a series of sermons on great blessings of the Christian faith. I've had the opportunity to this point to share uh, several lessons on this general theme, including the fact that in Christianity we find a Father who loves us, a Savior who understands us, and a guidebook that won't mislead us. This lesson wants to focus upon the yesterdays of our lives and to remind ourselves that we also find in Christ a yesterday that does not have to torment us any longer. Paul had promised the church at Ephesus and all children of God by implication in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Anything that we need to get to heaven, all that we need to live spiritually productive lives and spiritually fulfilled lives in this world, God makes available to us as Christians through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And one of those great blessings is a yesterday that won't torment us. It's no secret to anybody that the world in which we live is a troubled place. There is so much turmoil and unrest throughout our world and even throughout our society here in America that sometimes we wonder just what the future may hold. Some of that unrest is civil unrest. There are places in this world right now where entire communities are being slaughtered, where entire races are being threatened. There is that civil unrest even in our own nation that we struggle with between people from different ethnic backgrounds. And civil unrest has created multiple problems for our society. There is domestic unrest. We live in a time almost unparalleled in regard to the breakdown of the home. From the time that I was born in the early 50s to today, there has been such an amazing change, not for the better, but for the worse, in the makeup of home life in so many places throughout our nation and our society. There was a time when I was a child when divorce was extremely rare and single parent homes were virtually non-existent. Obviously, those sorts of things have changed and have had a terrible effect upon our society in many ways. We also live in a time of economic unrest. There was a time, especially immediately following World War II, when people could enter into a job or a career and look forward to being there for as long as they wanted to work. That's not true today. Oftentimes, there is very little sense of loyalty on the part of either employer or employee. And it's very difficult for anyone who's working to feel secure and to plan too much on being in that job for years and years to come. And the result of that uncertainty affects the economy in so many ways. It's a world in turmoil. In many ways, we are a society in turmoil. But you know, the greatest unrest that most of us struggle with is not civil unrest. It's not domestic unrest. It's not even economic unrest. For many of us, it's far more internal. It is the unrest that grows out of an unsettled conscience. I read some time ago about a man who came into a police station and surrendered to the authorities. Now that in and of itself might not be all that unusual, but the background behind that story is this man had committed a crime 20 years before, and he had gotten away with it. No one had been able to solve the crime. The police had given up on it and put it away in their cold case files and were basically resigned to the fact that they would never know who did this thing. But this man came in and confessed to a crime that he could have gotten away with, except for the fact that when asked why he was surrendering, when no one knew he had done it, he said, I just could not live with the guilt anymore. He was afflicted with the unrest of an unsettled conscience. 
the IRS, at least at one time, had what it called a conscience fund. People who had cheated on their taxes in years past would sometimes send anonymously money to the IRS to cover what they had cheated on in years before. Why would they do that? Not necessarily out of fear of being caught, but simply because they knew that what they had done was wrong and they couldn't live with it anymore. It was difficult to face themselves in the mirror knowing that they had cheated. I sometimes wonder how many heads hang low even in church buildings because people are struggling with the guilt that their conscience has brought them. The word conscience refers to that part about us that is our sense of right and wrong. It tends to grow out of the values that we learn as we're growing up and it is that sort of sentry that stands guard over the choices that we make. And when conscience begins to bother us, that's usually a warning signal that we have strayed into an area that we're fairly sure we ought not to be in. That we've chosen to do something or say something or go somewhere that we're not really convinced is right for us to say, do, or go. And when we violate our conscience, we often pay a very gruesome price as a result. And there are few things that can pain a person more than the guilt of a conscience that's been violated. Throughout the scripture, we find that to be true. In the book of Genesis, it's Adam and Eve hiding in the floor of the garden when God in the cool of the evening comes for an appointment with them. Their conscience has bothered them in violating his will to the point they can't stand to face him. They hide. In Genesis, the 50th chapter, it's Joseph's brothers cowering before him in fear. For now their father's dead and they're afraid that Joseph will now exact retribution for what they did so many years ago to him. Joseph was not going to do that and he had made it plain to them that he was not going to do that, but their conscience would not relieve them of the guilt and the burden of having sold their brother into slavery. In 1 Samuel 26, we read of David a second time getting the, I guess you would say, the, the advantage over King Saul. This was a period of time in David's life before he was the king of Israel when Saul, in envy and jealousy of David, was hunting him down like a dog. And this time David surprised Saul and could easily have killed him. But David would not do that to one the Lord had anointed king. And Saul's conscience got the better of him in light of David sparing him and he says, I have sinned, I have played the fool. As maddening as Saul could sometimes be, he still had a conscience. And he knew in times such as this that he was wrong, that he was violating his belief as to what was right and wrong. It's often with humor that I read the fifth chapter of Daniel when Belshazzar then the acting king of Babylon, Babylonia sees a giant hand and it's writing on the wall. And according to Daniel chapter 5, the king's countenance changed. You could just see it by the look on his face. His thoughts troubled it. Inside, conscience was eating at it. His hip joints loosened. It's all he could do to stand up. And his knees knocked together. We serve a God who makes kings tremble. But Belshazzar's trembling was not just from what he was seeing, it was what, what he was seeing was reminding him of internally. That he was not the person, the ruler, that he ought to be. In Luke the 18th chapter, it's a publican in the temple not even being able to lift up his eyes toward the heaven, but just simply with head bowed, smoting himself on the, or on the chest and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. In Matthew 27, it's, G, or it's Judas full of remorse at having betrayed his Savior. 
casting the money he got for betraying him at the feet of the Jews and then going out and hanging himself. In Revelation 6, it's people hiding under the rocks and wanting the mountains to fall on them and hide them from Jesus when he returns. Each of these and many other episodes like them in Scripture are reminders to us of the pain and the torment of our conscience. When we make bad choices, when we make bad decisions, and we know we have, we do not live easily with ourselves. It's difficult to face ourselves in the mirror. Conscience is a powerful thing when it's educated properly. Paul told the church at Rome in Romans 13 and verse 5 that they ought to be subject to the civil authorities, in part because of wrath or the fact that they could be punished if they violated the laws of their country. But more so, he says, do it for conscience' sake so that you won't punish yourself so that you won't have to live with the guilt you'll feel. In the 14th chapter of Romans, in verse 23, Paul revisits conscience when he encourages us not to do things unless we are certain it's right for us to do them. For if there is any doubt, he says, then it's not from faith. And if it's not of faith, then it's sin. And we'll pay the price of a guilty conscience and the torment it brings us. The eighth chapter of John, there is an episode in the life of Jesus when a woman is caught in the very act of adultery. She's brought by some of Jesus' enemies to him in hopes that they'll be able to catch Jesus making a mistake in how to deal with her. They know that he should condemn her, for the law condemned adulterers. But instead, he bowed down and started writing something in the soil reminding people that those without sin could cast the first stone. In John chapter 8 and verse 9, John says, Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one. They had hoped to trap Jesus. Instead, Jesus, through their conscience, trapped them. When he realized that all of the accusers had vanished away, he turned to the lady and said, where are those who condemn you? She said, they're gone. And Jesus said, well, neither do I condemn you. You go and sin no more. Conscience. How it torments us when we choose wrongly. And yet Hebrews 9 and verse 14 reminds us that the blood of Jesus Christ is designed to purge our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God. A violated conscience is a powerful, powerful, tormenting force in our lives. But even conscience and the torment it brings us when we violate it can be healed by Jesus Christ. One of the powerful blessings of Christianity is relief from yesterday's torment. In Luke 22, verses 61 and 62, we read of Peter's denial of Jesus. Jesus had told Peter he was going to do this, and Peter just couldn't imagine that to be true. But when the time came, he did. He denied Jesus as Jesus predicted he would, when Jesus predicted he would, before the cock crowed. But when the cock or the rooster finally crowed, Jesus caught Peter's eye. And Peter realized and remembered what Jesus had said. And he went out and wept bitterly. I sometimes wonder if Peter ever heard another rooster crow for the rest of his life, but that he remembered that night what he had done and the look on Jesus' face. But Peter was now tormented by a bad decision, by a terrible choice and how tormented he must have been. But in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 16, or rather chapter 5 and verse 1, Peter talks about the fact that he now at this point, many years later, is an elder in the Lord's church, and that he was a witness of the suffering of Christ and would be a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. 
He who felt so bad the night of the denial feels so good now as an older man looking forward to the glory that someday he'll receive. How could that happen? What could take Peter from the torment of the night of Jesus' betrayal to the optimism of the time when Jesus would come back? There's a similar episode in the second chapter of the book of Acts. Thousands of Jews are assembled. It's the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And Peter and the other apostles stand up before them, get their attention through a miracle from God, and then begin to preach what we often call the first gospel sermon. In the course of preaching that sermon, they lay bare the history behind Jesus of Nazareth's life, point out his resurrection and how that the Old Testament had predicted such things, and then proclaimed openly and plainly that the same Jesus who these Jews who were listening had crucified had been made both Lord and Christ. And when the Jews heard that, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, I wasn't there to hear them. I don't know the tone of their voice. But when I read that with imagination, I sometimes sense that that may have been an expression of hopelessness. That what they may have been saying by the tone of their voice when they uttered, men and brethren, what shall we do? is indeed nothing less than, is there anything that could forgive us for that? Is there any way that that cannot be held against us? They were so tormented by the awareness that they had not just crucified a man from Nazareth, they had crucified their Christ, their King. But when you go further down into the second chapter of the book of Acts, down to verses 46 and 47, these same people who cried out so helplessly and so hopelessly, what shall we do? Are said to have been eating their food with gladness and simplicity of heart and that they were praising God and having favor with all the people. Why the change? How could it be possible? in a matter of hours or days or perhaps weeks at the longest, a desperate, hopeless, tormented group of people are happy and full of praise for God and feeling safe and secure in His love. Still another illustration of this change from the torment of guilt is seen in the life of Saul of Tarsus, or as we know him better, the Apostle Paul. In 1 Timothy 1 verses 13 through 15, Paul relates that time when he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man. And then he talks about sinners and says, of whom I am chief. Saul of Tarsus, when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, according to the story of Acts chapter 9, was guilty within himself, tormented by his conscience for what he had done contrary to Christianity. But this same tormented man on the road to Damascus would write from a Roman prison in 2 Timothy 4, I am about to be offered the time of my departure is hand, but I have fought a good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, and henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in that day. How do you get from that tormented man that Saul of Tarsus was on the road to Damascus to that man the Apostle Paul was in that Roman prison, confident that even in death he was going to be a winner? There's only one answer, and that's Jesus. The entrance of Jesus into these people's lives took them from feeling bad to feeling good, from feeling guilty to feeling safe and secure. In Peter's case, it may well have been an episode with Jesus that's related in John the 21st chapter 
when Jesus says to Peter three times, one for each time Peter denied him, do you love me? And then went on to challenge Peter to feed his sheep. That may well have been Jesus' way of saying to Peter, despite what you've done, you're not hopeless. I have a place for you in my kingdom. And if you love me, I have work for you to do. And when Peter realized that he wasn't hopeless, when he realized that Jesus was willing to forgive him and use him, Peter's guilty conscience faded into the background and he relished the opportunity to give and to be given for the cause of the Savior he loved so much. In regard to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, the answer is really spelled out between the time they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were found cheerful and praising God and having favor with all the people. The answer very simply was that when they said, What shall we do? Peter and the others told them, Repent and be baptized for the remission of or in order to receive the remission or forgiveness of your sins. And they that gladly received that word, Luke records, were baptized. And that day about 3,000 were added to the church. They who had been so hopeless, who wondered if anything could take away the sting of what they had done to Jesus, could remove the guilt and the shame that they felt, now knew that God would that he would not hold it to their account. And when they were baptized into Christ, they did not do so reluctantly or hesitantly. They embraced it with welcome and cheer because then they knew that their conscience would not have to bother them again, that God was forgiving and God was forgetting. In the case of Saul of Tarsus, it was arriving in Damascus, meeting with a Christian there by the name of Ananias, and being told after a period of prayer and fasting to not wait any longer, but to arise and to be baptized and to wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And when he did that, Saul of Tarsus would not have to wrestle anymore with what he did to the church. He could begin to focus on what he could do for the church. He did not any longer have to identify himself solely as an enemy of the Christ. Now he could be one of the Christ's apostles and probably the greatest single human evangelist the world has ever known. All of these people, Peter, the Jews at Pentecost, and Saul of Tarsus, experienced the terrible agony and torment of a guilty conscience but they subsequently enjoyed the blessing of forgiveness. When Jesus came into their lives, they transitioned from feeling guilty to feeling good. Now, 2,000 years later, it's no different for us. We still make bad choices. We still make bad decisions. And many of us pay the price of a tormenting conscience for having done so. But if we're willing to repent of that, and we're willing to believe and to confess our belief that Jesus is the Son of God and will be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, all of that guilt, all of that sin is taken away. And we don't have to be tormented anymore. One of the greatest blessings of Christianity is that yesterday doesn't have to torment the child of God. He has been forgiven, and that forgiveness can bring cheer where once there was sorrow. We have been promised that God will be merciful to our iniquities, and our sins He will remember against us no more. We hope that you will embrace that forgiveness, find relief from torment, and be blessed by the Christian faith. Thank you. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. 
or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map, don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.